I got a phone call from Sam saying, I've got a script, very ambitious, sending it. I read it in an hour and a half, called him up, and he says, are you in? I said, we got to do this. This is going to be amazing. I've worked with Dennis Gassner five times now. We started working together on Road to Perdition way back, and he designed Blade Runner and Skyfall and some of your favorite Coen Brothers movies. When we finished shooting, Sam said, you know, I think these may be the best sets you've ever done. You know, and I said, well, thank you. And I said, it's uh, certainly been the biggest. <laughs> The challenges of prepping this movie are the challenges of prepping a normal movie times about five. We had to measure every step of the journey. In the early days of rehearsing, me and George and Sam, we turned up to this open field that was pretty much nothing there other than grass. And we had the script in our hand and we literally just walked and talked every single scene to see how long it took us to get from A to B. The scene has to be the exact length of the land, and the land cannot be longer than the scene, and the scene cannot be longer than the land. So you have to rehearse every line of dialogue on location. And that's where it overlaps with doing theatre, because the world has to be crafted around the rhythm of the script. You almost have to change the way you think about how we view movies as a viewer and how we make movies as a filmmaker. The art department, more than anyone, has been really affected just figuring out the scale of how large these sets need to be. It's a highly choreographed piece, so every inch has to be accounted for. It was an amazing amount of work. Every place that we went was a magnitude of problems to solve. You have all these locations that are basically just ground, and you have to create something out of it. There's no point in constructing a set as you would for a normal film in 360 degrees if you're only going to see half of that. And you know that up front. You're looking that way, so don't build what's behind the camera. You have to put all your resources where the camera will see it. We had a lot of group conversations about the sets, whether it was over models or illustrations that Dennis had done. We wanted to understand the physicality of what we had to build. The models were amazingly valuable for everybody. This is the model room, and all the concepts are here for the total narrative. So this is actually the reality of the journey, starting here. We dug a huge trench system. It's about a mile of trenches uh, in total. To dig it was quite a task. When we were digging, we were still doing rehearsals. We were still staking out the trench lengths so that we could hone in the exact distances that we needed. The level of detail that the design department put into the trenches themselves was extraordinary. We continued the journey out to no man's land. The set begins here, and we move through to our break through the line. It's very difficult to give a feeling of the scale of no man's land. There's a desolation about it. It's just this empty wasteland of dead bodies and hell on earth. Moving on to the cherry orchard and down to the farmhouse. The cherry orchard scene is one of my favorite scenes in the film, and that set was so beautiful. I remember Dennis talking about the specifics of kind of where he would place a tree, which, to be honest, I hadn't noticed. I've asked for about four or five trees to put in the farmhouse. And when the trees came in, the greens department came and said, oh, I'm sorry, there's this one tree that we're not sure if it really works or not. It had been naturally split down the middle. And I said, oh, that's absolutely amazing. I'm going to put that tree right where Dean dies. And it was the perfect metaphor for the parting of the two men. It sort of gave us magical quality to it, which is sort of subconscious. And that kind of conscious understanding of how to make a subconscious feeling was really amazing. 
the first few rehearsals we did back in November. It was a completely blank piece of land. It had the expanse of sky and the vistas that we were looking for, but didn't have a French farmhouse sitting in that landscape. So clearly then you needed the production design department to design and build one in a way that felt credible and authentic. Some of the locals couldn't believe the quality and, and the finish of it. It looked like it had been there for a long time, and the set dressing and the finishes on that set were extraordinary. It was just so real. You sort of get lost in it. It's really one of my favorite sets of the film. The whole house is kind of a memory. It's a memory of a family that once actually lived there. So it became almost this vast sculpture. It kind of stopped being a set at that point and became like a reality. I kind of took the approach of the film as saying, make it beautiful even though it's destroyed, because the beauty within that is the experience. Finding these locations was a challenge of its own because ideally, you know, we were gonna find all of this within 50 miles of London, but we just couldn't find it in terms of the vastness of the landscape uh, anywhere in the close vicinity. Since Sam was looking for these amazing kind of industrial canals based on the stories that his grandfather told him, the only place that we could find that was Govan Docks in Scotland. The first location that I had gone to, I sat for an hour and a half trying to figure out how to make it work, and I couldn't. And then we went up to Glasgow, and within five minutes, it was like, oh, it's all here. It's great. I could see it. I was so thrilled when Dennis worked it out where the bridge was going to go, because I remember thinking, God, we've got to shoot here. This is special. It's a really rich part of the city historically. A lot of the kind of famous British naval ships and everything were built here. My grandfather actually worked in a haulage firm that used to work in these very docks. It's laid abandoned for 30 years, so we have conducted dive surveys to check the condition of the dock, to check the dock gates themselves, and to make sure it was suitable for us to come and put in our bridge set piece. This was a very impressive set piece. This is where Schofield goes up a broken down bridge and does a stunt jump, uh, crosses to the other side. Acoust, I think, was one of Dennis Gaster's finest hours. It was a wonderful, extraordinary set. What Dennis was doing was constructing a lost world. You sense where the cafes were, you sense where the tobacconists were, even though very little of it remains. It's an enormous task to take a set and build it from the reality of the set and then break it down into what three and a half, uh, four years of war has done to it. And of course, then came the issue of how do we light it. There's a scene where they had all these flares going up over the top of the town, and those flares were lighting the whole scene. So we needed to figure out how much time the flares needed to be in the air to get the look we were after. They had this model where they were testing which way the shadows moved. What was key was the way the light fell through the windows to create the shadow and the layers of light. It almost feels like the ground beneath his feet is moving because the light is moving. There's something nightmarish about it and strange. The level of detail that's gone into it, all the sets, it was just awe-inspiring. Dennis has done an amazing job. As an actor, it really helps you just get lost in the scene. My hope is that it's something that will be groundbreaking. Something that's going to push the boundaries and say that this can be done.
This is why I get up every day, and, and it's amazing.